This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 36, recorded on June 27th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hey, how you doing? I haven't uh, done a TWIM for a while, have we? A couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks, and since then, I've come down with an RNA virus. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of a rhinovirus. This is what, what happens is uh, when you associate with me. That's what happens. You know, well, I have worked on RNA viruses all my career. I know that. So I know that. Well, why don't you do me. something about the common cold instead of just talking about it? <laughs> you know, in fact, my lab does work on the common cold. Well, when are going to? I don't want to know that. I want to know when you you're going to cure it. Gonna yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. Also joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello there, Vincent and Elio. Welcome home. I guess we were all away last week, and I guess we're all happy to be sleeping in our own beds. Yeah, I, uh, I think all three of us were together for a brief time in San Francisco at the general meeting of ASM, which we'll tell you a little bit about today. Did you have a good meeting, Michael? It was uh, very hectic. There were too many things going on at the same time. I, I felt torn of of what to listen to, and um, yeah, there was too just choices, too much yeah. to do. We'll talk about more about that yeah. more later. It was good to see all of you there. Uh, I actually even met, so I met Alio the first time in person. Right. That was Neat. nice. And I met Joe Handelsman also, first time in person, who has been on TWIM, as, as listeners know, so that was fun. And um, we'll tell you a little bit about the meeting later. We do have a very interesting paper to discuss with you today, which uh, involves a microbe that we have not yet encountered here on TWIM. Is that correct, Elio? We have not talked about I believe that's tr- I believe that's true. I don't remember so talking they, about this it. This was a... Um, this was a paper that Alio brought to our attention, which was published in PLOS One. And it, the, the name of the paper is The Origin of the Mycoplasma Mycoides Cluster Coincides with Domestication of Ruminants. And so, as a little background, perhaps, you can tell us about Mycoplasma, Alio. Okay, I'll do that. And the reason I want to do it is because these are... Uh, fen- Phenomenally interesting outliers. You know, when you think about it, biology is full of exceptions and uh, sort of things which are off to the side, and you don't quite know where to fit them in your, you know, in your in your head. And mycoplasma really deserve a lot of attention because they're far out. So what are they? They are wall-less microbes. So this is a bacteria that don't have a peptidoglycan cell wall. That's for they're said to be shapeless because they are like little tiny amoebas. That's not quite true. They really have quite a bit of shape left. Anyhow, they are small, uh, small in both in cell size and in genome size, and this is what caused uh, caused them to come into some prominence for the people who do synthetic. Uh, uh, or systems biology and synthetic biology because their genomes are about, can be as, as small as 500,000 base pairs, which is a tenth of that of E. coli roughly, uh, although some are bigger than that. Anyhow, they are the smallest organisms that can be grown on agar plates that, is, that are capable of independent existence, even though in nature probably most of them are host or uh, associated, not all of them, some are found on, on, on plant um, leaves and so forth. Anyhow, uh, everything about them is different. They are uh, potential, they're pathogens. They cause, a, in this case, we're going to talk about the very miserable disease of cattle and of uh, 
uh, goats called uh, pleuropneumonia, the very contagious diseases. In humans, they are less so, although there are diseases that they cause, which are usually, uh, there's a mycoplasma pneumonia, which is associated with with um, uh, pulmonary infections and so forth. Uh, Michael, I know that when you teach about this, you sort of have to take time out, don't you, and explain to the students this is something a little bit different. Huh? It's, it's very important. It's in- interesting that you, you bring that up because... The first thing they have to appreciate is that you it, it does cause pneumonia, and typically the way most people think of pneumonia is you immediately go to strep. And of course, penicillin was the drug of choice for many years for uh, streptococcal pneumonia. And of course, it has no effect whatsoever on these Wallace bacteria. So you have to talk the, the, about... The target, the target for penicillin is missing, right? Yeah, peptidoglycan. So right. it's a really good way of introducing how antibiotics work and, and targets and selection of the proper target. But more importantly, you begin to weave the story that the microbes are relying on their host for their support of their life. And that's what I found most fascinating about this paper is is how it goes into as man began to come out of the hunter gatherer and began to domesticate animals for use we also began to domesticate bacteria that um, are now uh, pathogens for us we've effectively had to domesticate pathogens it's really almost an oxymoronic expression of domesticating a pathogen but it what it really means is it illustrates how the microbe can jump from species from host to host not meaning human to human but human to cow cow to goat etc and that's what we're going to learn about here today so michael when you get pneumonia a, a mycoplasma pneumonia you get it from another person right typically yes Okay. Now, Elia, you mentioned there are some mycoplasmas associated with plants. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah. So do other uh, kinds of animals as well, well, other life forms, say fish or insects, do they have mycoplasma too? Uh, yes. There is, in fact, one which I want to talk about, mycoplasma mobili, which is associated with fish diseases and is found in the ocean, in fact. So, yeah, they're widespread. They're really widespread. And so these are these sort of, uh, you know, 50-pound weaklings, <laughs> you know, which uh, don't have a wall. They don't... Uh, you know, they don't grow very fast and so forth, and they're all over the place. Uh, by the way, let me want to say one thing about the pneumonia, because readers or listeners may remember this. You've heard of walking pneumonia, that is a pneumonia that doesn't knock you down so much that you have to be in bed, but you feel miserable. Well, that's usually mycoplasma pneumonia. So anyhow, that, that said... I'm going to again make one of my digressions into a subject that has very little to do with the paper today, but I find it fascinating beyond words. It has to do with the, how these guys move on, on agar surfaces or probably on other surfaces. They move by a thing called gliding motility, about which a fair amount is known. And what is known about him is, well, mainly from this one guy, actually I mentioned the mycoplasma mobile, the uh, fish pathogen or fish-associated organism. These guys move uh, by what, this gliding motility is just what it says, what it sounds like. They glide along the surface. Uh, they're not, has nothing to do with flagella. They move at pretty good speeds, about five microns per second, which in this case is uh, three to eight body lengths per second, which is quite respectable. They do this with ATP hydrolysis, and they do it with a very specialized structure unknown elsewhere in microbiology. Okay? The structure is a nose, if you want to. So picture, picture these guys uh, looking like a light bulb. Uh, or a schmoo. A Their schmoo, is- but listen, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, many of our listeners are not going to remember what a schmoo was. A schmoo That's was a, a cartoon made up by Al Cap, who was the guy who drew little Abner cartoons. And schmoos were um, 
supposed to be these sort of shapeless blobs hmm. that did everything for mankind, and mankind retributed by by uh, by doing what? By trying to kill him out. <laughs> Anyhow, schmoes are this. Um, let's say, a light bulb shape, if you can imagine. So at the end of the light bulb is the nose, and that is, has a solid structure, hemispherical structure, corresponding to, I guess, where the bulb threads into the outlet, and it's called a bell. Anyhow, coming out of this bell are dozens of tentacles, which are proteins, uh, particles about 20 nanometers in length, and they are spaced evenly. They sort of make this look like a, oh gosh, what? A, a polyp, maybe, something like that. Yeah, I think that's that's a good ex- good description. Okay, good. Anyhow, these uh, things, extend. They, they're called the legs, and the fair amount is known about them. They extend themselves over the surface, and then they retract, just like an inchworm would do. Can you picture that? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And so when they do that, then they extend again and retract again. And so they move forward by this mechanism, which physicists are going to town with. I mean, there's really quite a lot of work about how many nanopascals of force these guys exert and stuff like that. They can, but strong enough, get this, they can tow a red blood cell Hmm. along, which is about 10 times their own size, okay? (laughs) And this thing is uh, of interest to to bioengineers because it becomes possible to make a biomotor. In fact, people have made biomotors using these structures, and a lot is known about the the protein structure, a lot is known about auxiliary proteins which are involved, all just absolutely gorgeous stuff, and I bet you that even seasoned microbiologists may not all have heard about this, and it is such an incredible story. You know, the inchworm mechanism of movement along surfaces. What do you I, think? Yeah, I, I, you put a movie, um, you sent us a movie link, which illustrates this movement very nicely, which we'll put here in the show notes. And, and they show in that movie that the movement depends on ATP, right? right. When they deplete yeah. it from the medium, they don't move. And then as soon as you add it back, uh, it will move That's again. Right. It's quite nice. So the presumption is this is how they move in natural situations as well. Right. Including perhaps in the body of animals, yeah. could be. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, it's just that it's, it's different, and this is what's so outstanding about. Let me say a couple of other things that are different. Uh, fairly unique in microbiology, some of them, not all of them, have steroids on their membranes. That's not the usual bacteria. Most bacteria don't have steroids. Another thing is that for a long time they were the bane of people doing animal cell culture. Why? Because a lot of animal cell culture is, uh, uh, cells are grown using fetal calf serum and things like that. Of course, they're filtered. The serum is filtered so that they don't introduce bacteria. But guess what? They go through the filter? It goes through the filter. It's probably not, not that it's that small, but it can probably distort itself. It doesn't mm-hmm. have a rigid structure. And so it's just, it, it squeezes itself through the pores of the filter. And for a long time, uh, this was a big pain because it altered. Well, first of all, the cell cultures were contaminated. I don't know, Vincent, you, you've done cell cultures all your life. Have you run into this? Oh, yeah, sure. You would periodically get mycoplasma in your cell cultures. And the thing is, they don't kill the cells. They live very happily with them. And so you often cannot tell that they're present. And, um, but they may have an effect on your results. So there, is, there are now several tests that you can run, which are basically staining for them. And you can check to see if they're there and you can, you can then treat the cultures to get rid of them. And it's really hard to get rid of them because many of them have now become resistant to antibiotics, and so it's very challenging to actually rid your cell lines of mycoplasma uh, contamination. I I've, I um, periodically get visited by my friends in the cell culture world who are having these inexplicable results, and they're you know the media pH is is going off more quickly, and they're really troubled by it, and um, some of the best tests out now, of course, are PCR because most labs have a PCR machine in their possession and you can mm. buy a kit and yeah. quickly yeah. assess 
for the presence of, of mycoplasma, and it really will skew your results, especially if you're looking for apoptosis and other things that may impact on the viability of, of your cells. And so it is a cautionary tale to anyone in eukaryotic biology that uh, you respect these little microbes, and they typically come off of the operator because we're constantly shedding mycoplasma. When you get a mycoplasma infection, it's often a very uh, long-lived infection. Even after the symptoms begin to ameliorate, it takes some time for your body to clear the infection. Even in the presence of of antibiotics, it, it takes a, a while to uh, mm. effectively purge yourself of all of these uh, bacteria. We, and so, we, we treat our cell cultures with Cipro to get rid of mycoplasma. Oh, really? Two-week course of Cipro, yeah. Which is, which is quite expensive. <laughs> yes, it's quite expensive. And, uh, you know, the, that gyrase inhibitor uh, similarly will interact with the mitochondria of your eukaryotic cells. And if you're looking at that sort of metabolism as part of your uh, experiments, you, you can uh, get different results. Yep, sure. By the way, the mycoplasma belong to a group of bacteria called the molecules which means the soft-skinned ones. Molecutes. And that's not a bad term, as opposed to the firmicutes, which is the genus Bacillus, Clostridium, and so forth, which means a tough or solid skin. The molecules means they have a, a, a low skin. By the way, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't quite say the right thing earlier. You asked me about whether they affect other things. There's a whole group called the spiroplasma, which uh, affect uh, plants, and they cause some pretty serious diseases called, mm -hmm. for instance, the corn stunt disease, the citrus stubborn disease. By the way, plant pathologists have great names for, for this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, and because they're so mysterious and so, well, mysterious, well, let's say they're sort of all, Outliers is a better term. They've even been blamed for chronic infections, and who knows, maybe they they have a role in that. So I, I think that mycoplasma are just wonderful things to study and that they, one should really pay a lot of attention. And as I say, to incorporate them into one thinking about microbes may be slightly demanding, but it certainly is... Rewarding. So, Elia, in terms of their <clears throat> relatedness to other bacteria, are these thought to be older or parallel? Or well, older and parallel. That's, that's you're asking a tough question because when it comes to the tree of life, uh, when it comes to the details, let's say within the bacteria, we really don't know much about the origins of them. We don't really know that much about it. They belong to the uh, gram-positive clades even though they're not, of course, gram-positive, not having a peptidic line. But ge genomically, they are closer to the gram-positive staph, strep, like the bacillus and so forth, than they are to the gram-negatives. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that brings us to the actual paper. And perhaps, Michael, you can do us the honor. Well, this is a, a really neat story. Um, th this mycoplasma that we're, we've been talking about, this Wallace bacterium, this is one of the most important livestock pathogens simply because it can result in mortalities of up to 80%. And this is a really big number if, if you're growing cows or, or sheep or goats. And, um, and typically what it does is it causes uh, pneumonia. And the particular microbe that we're talking about is is mycoplasma mycoides cluster mycoides 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 cluster just like uh, bacillus cereus variant mycoides and um, this particular microbe causes contagious bovine pleural pneumonia in um, cows and it also causes contagious caprine pleural pneumonia and caprine after goats. And so these investigators uh, talk about the story of the movement of this microbe from Europe uh, back in the uh, 18th century and how it moved out of Europe 
into uh, Africa, North America, Australia, and New Zealand during the colonial time when the, the old world was moving lock, stock, and literally livestock <laughs> to these other continents. And as they were moving these animals to these continents, they were similarly moving these strains of microbes to the other continents. And By the way, as you, before you get into that, it's interesting that the authors, of which there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, represent something like six different countries. Yes. So this is appropriately international <laughs> for the purpose of this paper. You needed an international group in order to conduct this study. Um, we're going to do a little digression here because the the paper is relatively straightforward and approachable in the sense what they're asking is how bacteria move and how they have changed. And so what what these folks did is they collected strains of this variant, uh, these variants of mycoplasma that caused various versions of pleural pneumonia in particular animals. And they uh, described that several... There are 123 strains, didn't they? It's quite a yes. few. Yeah, so that's, that's again, um, you, you can well imagine uh, the challenges of, of recovering these strains from, from this livestock. Um, the goat version of the pleural pneumonia, the caprine or the CCPP, was first described in Algeria, and its highly contagious nature was acknowledged um, after a subsequent outbreak in South Africa in 1881, where they ended up blaming uh, the importation of infected goats from Turkey. So again, you're effectively tracking livestock, and it's really you're moving the microbe literally across the continent from Turkey all the from Turkey, which some people can view as half Europe, half Asia moving it all the way down to um, South Africa. What they then did is several, they, they described their conundrum. They, there were several studies that have attempted to resolve the evolutionary relationships between these mycoplasma clusters, and um, they tried to infer the evolutionary history of the single members within the cluster. How, however, and I guess another digression is this was the first microbe for which we had a complete genome sequence. Oh, that's it, right. It made the cover of science. It was the first uh, sequence that Ventner's well, group. Wait actually, a minute, wasn't wait a minute. Haemophilus was the first one. Oh, that's right. It was Haemophilus, and yeah. then, then but this came another, out shortly afterwards. This one came out shortly afterwards. I forgot about Haemophilus, but they're again basically uh, small genomes. And uh, so, obviously, you don't want to sequence the whole genome since that becomes very e expensive. So, in the it used to be, like, used to, it's getting cheaper by the day. But cheaper, still. cheaper by the day. But the technology that this particular group used in order to describe uh, the movement. I'm not going to refer to it as evolution, but actually movement. Because uh, the way I view these livestock groups is effectively they become islands. And again, the microbes are being shared amongst animals. The epidemic goes through a particular population. Is, and if it's especially virulent, it's, it's going to um, you know, have a devastating effect on the population. And then, of course, it dies off unless the microbe is able to jump to a different type of host. Uh, going from uh, cow to goat or goat to something else, and then whether it goes into the natural uh, ruminant population. This this particular mycoplasma is actually coincide with the domestic ruminants, which are goats and sheep and, and cows and the like. And so the technology that they used is uh, was principally developed uh, in the late 90s, uh, for uh, looking at uh, Neisseria and uh, specifically trying to ask the question about, again, 
the evolution of Neisseria meningitidis, which of course is a, a fulminant pathogen that can have devastating effects in very young children and very young adults. And they developed this technique called multi-locus sequence typing, or MLST. And the way this technique works is it bases its hypothesis on being able to track movement or evolution based on uh, effectively looking at the sequences of between 6 and 11 housekeeping genes. And in this particular paper here, what these authors used are seven housekeeping genes. And the seven housekeeping genes are things like uh, DNA-directed RNA polymerase, uh, specifically the beta chain, or RPOB. Another housekeeping gene that's commonly used is RecA. And everybody's heard of, of RecA and understands its utility. Another one uh, was glucose 6-phosphate isomerase. And we all realize that the only way we're able, bacteria are able to concentrate glucose into their cells is because they immediately isomerize it, again, to lie to the second law of thermodynamics and uh, get around things. Um, Vincent's friend, since he uses Cipro, DNA gyrase B is another housekeeping gene. And guanylate kinase and adenylate kinase round out the seven. Why housekeeping, Michael, not other well, genes? I'm getting to the point. Okay. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> listing the yeah. seven genes. So, uh, the, point, the point of using seven genes is if you just depended on the usual alternative, which is 16S RNA, you may be looking at exceptional cases where the relationships are misleading because... So, not everything is perfect, but if you just look at the single locus, if you look at seven loci, okay. the chances of that are dampened out, right? Right. And the technique uses a number of well-chosen housekeeping genes. And these genes are not sequenced in total because many of them are, could be up to thousands of base pairs in length. And this was developed at a time when sequencing was expensive. So what they typically do is they sequence a smaller chunk, typically between four and 500 base pairs, and they have a prototype strain, and let's just call this strain A, and they get it sequenced. So they've sequenced it a number of times, and they know about its variability, and they know that this is a relatively stable portion of the gene where mutations will not occur with a much higher frequency uh, than point mutations. So they're going to be able to detect recombination. And so you then don't actually look for the total sequence similarity between strains. You actually look for differences in genes, and they refer to these genes as alleles. This technique was a uh, derivative of the old technique of looking at enzymes. Many of us are old enough to remember starch gels where you would look at proteins that would um, eat starch and then you would look at them on a gel and you would stain it with iodine and you would see where the protein was migrating. And you could tell uh, if there was a variation in the protein. That was instead of multi-locus sequence typing, it was multi-locus enzyme or MLEE. -E. I think, if, if I'm remembering my acronyms properly. So anyway, you have these seven genes, and you sequence these strains. So it's very important to have a number of strains. And then you just simply ask a simple question, is there a difference between strain A and strain B in the sequence? If the answer is yes, you assign it a new number. If the answer is no, it gets the same number as the uh, prototypical strain. And you develop a series of numbers. And so each allele is a number. And so the prototypical strain will have a phone number of seven. In this particular case where we have seven genes, it has the phone number of seven ones in a row. And if you have a second strain that has a mutation in one of the housekeeping genes, 
it will get a telephone number of a two for the gene that is changed, and then all the others will have a one unless there's a mutation, and then they'll get another number. So you are effectively developing phone numbers based on seven digits, and you can effectively tell the difference between the microbes. And since we all understand metaphorically telephone numbers, and we understand the significance <laughs> of changing one digit because we've all dialed the wrong number, you can begin to then imagine how you can tell if a strain is different. Does it have a different phone number? Boy, and, there's a lovely there's a lovely analogy you made. I think it's lovely. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've been try wrestling with how to explain this to med students and Medical students are intolerant of <laughs> genetic e explanations with math, and but they all understand phone numbers. And so I, I've thought about this because multilocus sequence typing is now pervasive for uh, tracking outbreaks and tracking where outbreaks have come from. And so as you can well imagine, uh, just like there are different area codes for different cities that you can, in this multi-locus sequence typing, you can have different area codes for where pathogens have come from. Well, it gets and, better and better. It gets better and better. <laughs> yeah. And so as you move the microbe and then as your telephone number ages in place, you, of course, have selection pressure on the micro or if there's recombination and things along those lines. So there's fancy software out there that uh, effectively can take these mutations. And since each allylic profile can be considered as a, and here's where the math comes in, as a character set, and in this particular example that we have in this paper today, we have seven categorical characters. And these seven categorical characters were then placed into this computer program called Structure. And Structure is this free software package that you can freely download. And it's used for multi-locus sequence data to investigate the population structure. That is, who begot who. It's sort of like Genesis. You know, you, you go through the list of Adam and you take it all the way out to me. You know, who begot who. And that's effectively what structure does from this uh, population perspective. And then what these authors have done is they did something called population demography. And they computed three different summary statistics. Uh, they computed nucleotide diversity, which is used to measure the degree of polymorphism within a population. So that is to say how many bacteria from this particular group of mycoplasma mycotes have a different telephone number. And so the average number of nucleotide differences per site between any two DNA sequences chosen randomly from a sample population, they give a value to, and then they can do some appropriate statistical tests in order to, to model it. Then they have two other variables. They have, uh, and I'm going to probably mispronounce this, uh, it's a Japanese name, Tajimiya no, D. Tajima. Tajima. Tajima, which is a statistical test created after this Japanese researcher, uh, Fumio Tajima. And it's, again, to distinguish between a DNA sequence evolving randomly, where you just have uh, neutral selection, uh, which means a, 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 a base substitution uh, as opposed to one on the evolving under a non-random process where you're actually, for example, if we were looking at uh, beta-lactamase and going after a drug, 
uh, you're effectively selecting for a microbe that will make a hyper secretion version of beta lactamase. And so they they looked at this and uh, they they describe in their summary statistics for the seven genes and seven populations uh, the genetic diversity of this and they then effectively model how old this particular species uh, has become and they can track it back to effectively the domestication of ruminants by humans approximately 10,000 years ago uh, by effectively doing the appropriate summary statistics, looking at each locus, and then they assessed how well a null model of comp constant population size and random mating fits for each, or each population by estimating these Tajima D and Fu F statistics. And in their particular table, the negative values reflect an excess of rare alleles, which can either be due to a demographic scenario such as the population expansion due to positive selection, which if you think if you're killing off 80% of the animals, that wouldn't necessarily be positive. That would probably be negative selection because they're not going to move very far. And um, they, they looked at um, all of these uh, variables, and without getting too much into the math, they uh, effectively came up with uh, the title of their paper that the origin of this cluster coincides with the domestication of ruminants. And I just found this thing to be a, a great story because it really shows how humans have not only domesticated livestock, but we've domesticated the pathogens that follow the animals so that, again, the pathogens can jump from species to species. One of the, one of the hallmarks that we try to teach um, when we begin exploring medical microbiology is the whole issue of zoonotic infections, which means an infection that normally infects an animal that jumps to a person as opposed to the strict human infections. And I guess you can almost argue that things like Staph aureus is a strict human infection, but we now know that Staph aureus is a zoonotic infection for pigs, having jumped from humans to pigs, especially in the case of MRSA. So basically what they say is all these... Um uh, these mycoides strains have a common ancestor. Correct. About 10,000 years ago. And that happens to coincide when uh, w when humans began to uh, take the wild uh, animals and put them on farms, right? Right. So the idea is that those animals had these mycoplasma infections, and then by bringing them all together, you perpetuate the uh, the infection and you spread it all over the world eventually, right? That's the idea. That's the idea. Now... To test this hypothesis, to actually demonstrate mm -hmm. that this, this pneumonia organism is coincident with the domestication of ruminants, I was always taught that the first pathogen that humans domesticated with animals was another bacterium that begins with M, and that's mycobacteria, specifically mm -hmm. You look at Mycobacterium bovis and Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae. And so the question is, could we similarly do MLST mm -hmm. using Mycobacterium leprae and Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium bovis, which are, again, bovis and tuberculosis, of course, uh, affect humans and you know, we can go to Yellowstone. This is a field trip experiment. We can go to Yellowstone National Park and, you know, get some of the Mycobacterium bovis from the buffalo and ask the question, did we introduce tuberculosis to the buffalo 
uh, and you, we can actually track back to when uh, those mycobacteria went with the buffalo or whether they were native to North America, and we could actually test this software and this um, technique to see whether or not the molecular chronometer, because that's effectively what this software is. It's a, it's a way to develop a molecular chronometer to age a particular species. Hmm. Well, I think it's a great story, really. There's a wonderful um, article that Alio found by Lucas Browers, which you re reprinted on your blog. It's called Live Livestock Bacteria Are As Old As The Livestock They Kill. And it's a nice summary of this story. And one thing I wanted to bring up from this, it says here, um, so mycoplasmicoides might be as ancient as livestock itself. The two most contagious and deadly strains are much younger. So the strains, the common ancestors of the strains that cause pneumonia in cows and goats lived between 91 and 414 and between 56 and 490 years ago. So he asks... What favored the survival of these hypervirulent bacteria in recent centuries? So why did they become so virulent? And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. The only hypothesis I could come up with is populations have increased of people interacting with the animals, and the microbe could hide out in humans, where it's not as virulent mm -hmm. as it is in the livestock. Mm. Mm. Great idea. That makes sense. So th this addresses an important question, which is, why do pathogens, it could be a virus or a bacterium, why do sometimes they become more virulent the longer they remain in their, their host population? There's no, an there's no good answer. Because it doesn't make terribly good sense that it should be more virulent because then you're killing your host. But there may be other benefits for the pathogen to acquire greater virulence. And so it may be a similar situation here. We don't know why. But it may have facilitated transmission, for example, or, or survival or some other parameter. Well, that's probably something that you've discussed on this week in virology is the cover of science this week has the H5N1 story on it, and they're beginning, uh, Carl Zimmer's story in the New York Times, uh, I guess this week was specifically about H5N1 and how it evolves to be more virulent. Yeah, well, I think they uh, they got that all wrong because um, it's it's more virulent in the, in the, in the people that that are killed by it, but not in everybody else. But we're, yeah. we're actually discussing that on Friday on This Week in Virology. So I'll have to tune in. You might want to tune in to that. <laughs> yeah. That's a really cool story. I like this. So, Michael, you suggest this could be done with other bacteria like TB, right? Any, yeah. uh, any others that uh, would be suitable? There's a whole laundry list. Yeah. And there's a website that um, is called pubmlst.org. And it literally describes um, all the microbes they're doing this with. They're doing it with oh, things cool. like Acinetobacter baimani. Uh, they're doing it after Burkholderia cepatia, Bacillus cereus, um, C. diff, uh, H. pylori. H. pylori, I think, is, is one of the cooler ones because, again, H. pylori is one of these ancient bacterial passengers of humans and they're able to track uh, migratory movements of man out of the fertile crescent and so i think h pylori looking at this um would be a a neat one so cool. um i think mlst because as ilio points out the cost of sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper and uh, this is an interesting segue into the meeting of last week. Um, I saw many benchtop DNA sequencers that can literally do bases. You, you get a base for less than 0. 0.000 something a cent. Wow. Uh, how, much do, mean, how much do these machines cost, Michael? They're about $100,000. Wow. That's all. They, that's <laughs> it's all. not bad. No, I mean, and the supplies aren't that 
expensive and uh, it's really driving down the cost. And I think one of the most exciting things that came out of the the vendor aspect of last week's meeting was the affordability that our our friends in and uh, companies or instrument companies have come up with. The Maldi uh, mass spectroscopy technology has dropped where you can ID a bacterium for a dime, hmm. which is really inexpensive. You still have to use a pure culture, but you can ID it for a dime, whereas most um, normal bacteriological media and technician time will cost you in excess of dollars, and they've dropped it to a dime. And with time, I'm sure that will come down. And, and the sequencing costs have, you know, fallen faster than I think anyone had ever anticipated. And, you know, it, it's really going to, I think, open up uh, many different ways of asking questions. Because MLST will now be something that you could almost imagine in an undergraduate laboratory to ask the questions about the buffalo. Sure. Because you can afford it uh, in an undergraduate laboratory. So I think uh, this paper is a good primer for people who want to get into MLST. And it, if you think about phone numbers, it'll be approachable. <laughs> but someday, Michael, no one will... No, from phones. I have a feeling they're on their way out, and they will be replaced <laughs> by something else. So you'll have to change your analogy. But yeah, right. you know, you know, most people don't remember phone numbers anymore because they're all programmed into your that's cell right. phone. And uh, I right. still dial. I still dial my See, neurons. You use the word dial from back when there was a dial. That's right. But we don't. I have still that. have a dial phone. You do. I do because I live in a hurricane prone region and I still have an old copper dial phone that you literally dial so it needs no power other than the wire that comes out Amazing. of the wall. I'm surprised it still works. So am I. So the the meeting we have uh, been referring to which I'd like to chat about a little bit is the general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. It's an annual meeting, and it took place last week in San Francisco, and all three of us were there, although I was only there for 36 hours. Uh, but let me just say a few words about this, and I'd like to hear what you, the two of you thought were the highlights of the meeting. I first, This was the first meeting I ever went to as a Ph.D. student in 1976. I went to the general meeting. It was in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it, to me it was amazing. It was so big. And at that time, there was a lot of virology at this general meeting. Now, in the 1980s, the virologists left uh, their general meeting. They made their own society, the American Society for Virology. And that's the meeting that we go to every year to hear about viruses. So for a long time, I didn't go to the GM. But now in the last few years, I started again because with uh, podcasting at, at ASM, I've, I've been going and I really enjoy it. Um, there's, there's a wide range of science going on there, and a lot of things as well. So I wonder if you, uh, Elio, you could tell us what, what nice well, things you found there. Well, first of all, I can tell you that I can beat you handily. My first meeting <coughs> of the <laughs> ASM John, was in 1952, in other words, um, what does this make it, 60 years ago. I was one year okay. before I was born. How about that? Uh, <laughs> anyhow, and it's a good thing, and I tell you, it, it, <laughs> I have something to tell you about it, because in those days, everybody went to a dinner, okay? There was sort of a dinner that was attended, a mass, that doesn't exist anymore. And I couldn't afford to go because of a poor graduate student. Well, guess what? All these microbiologists went to this dinner and came down with food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Anyhow, this meeting. Well, it's impossible to encapsulate what, what all happened. The highlights, I think, uh, is that it coincided with the announcement of the first um, in-depth description of the human microbiome, which was presented there. And I got to tell you, I stayed away from those sessions. I wonder if, Michael, did you go to those sessions on the microbiome? I only went to one, and it was the last day, the session that many people can 
view because the society uh, streamed it live, and I think they probably archived it. Yeah. And they were unfortunately very short talks, and they had tremendous amounts of information that they disseminated. In, that's it. And that's why I, that's why I stayed away because I have a feeling that although this is incredibly important stuff, I don't deny that for a second. But frankly, listening to it unfold is not the most exciting thing in the world. I mean, it's data and data and data and data. It's a little bit like reading the white pages of the phone book. I mean, I'm, I'm not one of my short of the work. It's fabulous and incredibly important. But as it develops, as it unfolds, it goes through stages, which is true for a lot of times when science goes through a breakthrough stage, where it's not that, fascinating to listen to so I, th I thought I could stay away from it and read the punchline in time you know and and in fact to put this into perspective for our, our listening audience it the there were papers there were approximately 16 to 20 papers that were simultaneously published in science magazine nature magazine and plus one and if it takes three journals to begin to disseminate this information. And science, I think, as well as nature, did a, a tremendous job in uh, putting it into perspective. You know, they, they describe an overview and they describe uh, some background. And that, I think, is what I was most disappointed in, in that they were really pushing out all of the, the data. And I think it would have better served folks if, if there had been a primer or a synthetic component. I had a conversation with Jonathan Eisen, who is a famous blogger. And, a uh, phylogenomicist. A phylogenomicist. And I, I talked with Jonathan in the hall about making this approachable uh, to my clinical colleagues because – Fundamentally, there are three questions that you need to be able to ask in order to determine whether the science is valid. How do you know? How do you show? And how does this fit in with the big picture? And thinking about the fancy statistics that are going into this brute force sequencing, it, it you really have to have an understanding of the jargon as well as an appreciation of the math that is really beginning to describe the scenario. One of my colleagues uh, came up to me and said, well, we're going to see a renaissance in microbial ecology. And the, the old Hungate followers where he never had a pure culture he always went out to nature to isolate in the raw are, are going to come back because it's it's effectively you're you're not you're moving from pure culture microbiology to really looking at a population dynamic and i think it's interesting that we we were talking about population dynamics in one of our papers here this morning and or I mean this afternoon, and you begin to look at what the science, where the science is going, and and so it was really uh, pretty phenomenal. the The talks were incredible. The scientists were extremely credible, and uh, it I, I had the general impression that my head was going to explode after yeah. even sitting in that one session. Are these all right. uh, normal, healthy humans that uh, these studies are done on, or do they have some? They they did a whole bunch. They they had, as my grandmother would say, they had soup to nuts. Okay. They they <laughs> had literally the whole gamut. They had healthy. There was one special session devoted to uh, women. Uh, specifically looking at women. There was another session looking at race. Uh, it was really pretty incredible. I unfortunately didn't. Uh, one of the sessions that I wanted to go to where they were looking at the microbiome based on uh, race, I, I couldn't get to because I had a, a competing session. And one of the things about the general meeting that I love but hate is the poster session. 
it is the most fascinating time spent. You you can spend your entire meeting in posters. Just and and the posters, there's thousands of posters. And uh they came up with it was a sea. You could you could see it from up above. It was amazing. It's just as the eye could as far as the eye could see, there were posters. And this is often the hottest science that's coming out. This is the stuff that the young PhD student, the young master's student uh, is putting out for the first peer review at this meeting where your colleagues wander up and down the aisles and literally can ask you any question. And, you know, some of the talks were, are, or they're not really talks, they're really a display and then you interact with the uh, individual and some of the the posters were just um, in incredible um, you know some of the simple ones that I they, they also had this really cool thing called the quartzy cards which are these they're four by five uh, index cards that has the primary author's contact information the title in a font size that I didn't need to use my glasses to read and then the abstract on the back. So this was a free thing that if you went and got them, you put next to your poster. And this was a tremendous innovation. Whoever thought of this is brilliant because this then helped me remember rather than scribbling in my notebook and illegible writing because you're standing up wandering through. This helped me remember which poster I had seen. And I wrote notes on the little card. Uh, questions they ask, what to go read. And I just found, I got a stack of these cards sitting in front of me and I got enough reading here to take me until Christmas. Just looking at the background and looking at some of the questions. Uh, Isn't it interesting how si very simple devices, which are essentially low tech, can really work. It's really amazing. And, you know, a lot of the bigger you know, like the more uh, scientific meetings are people are printing their posters. Now, granted, they're typically on 11 by 17 paper and you have the whole poster. But I don't know about you guys, but I can't read 11 by 17 posters that are, you know, four by five feet reduced to font size one. Get a magnifying glass, Michael. Yeah, then I set my desk on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, Elio, what did you like? Did you go to a talk you really liked? Well, yeah, I I heard a talk. Uh, um, at the, it was the presidential forum. It was a talk by John McElanos, who's at Harvard, who is a big authority on uh, video cholera. And he talked about uh, something he had, was discovered in his lab, namely a no longer novel, at that time novel, uh, secretion mechanism called type 6 secretion. I'll remind you there are obviously five secretion mechanisms before that. The most known, the most notorious one is type 3 secretion, which is in, consists of the bacteria making an injectosome, a whole apparatus that helps to inject proteins and they do use this to inject effector proteins, that is proteins that do something to the host cell directly into the cytoplasm of the host cell. This is a, uh, a way to save on making toxins. The alternative is to secrete toxins into the environment. Well, think about it. They're going to be dilute as can be, right? So you have to make an awful lot of them to be effective. But if you can inject them directly into the cytoplasm, then, you know, it doesn't take that much. Anyhow, type 6 is a little bit different because it's really, it looks for the world like tail, the, the tails of bacteriophages. And what's interesting about it is that the spoke, which is the little uh, uh, thin, long protein thread, which is inside the tail, gets secreted, and with it probably a number of effects, well, there is a number of other proteins that go with it. That's been known for some time, and it's terribly important, and in the case of Vibrio, it really makes a difference in its pathogenesis, one of the major pathogenic virulence factors of Vibrio. Uh, but what was shown here is that with gusto, these guys don't just inject their proteins into host cells, they do it to other bacteria. So he shows some magnificent pictures 
in uh, fluorescent live bacteria showing the penetration of the fluorescent dye, namely the spoke uh, of the tail, into different bacteria. So they had Vibrio injecting this on Pseudomonas, and I believe it was Pseudomonas into coli, and so Vibrio into Vibrio. Now, it's not, I, I, maybe he said it and maybe I didn't catch it, I don't, but I'm not sure it's known what all gets injected besides the spoke. But this is sort of an amazing mechanism. Imagine the transfer of proteins, not DNA. DNA has been known since 1928 or since 1941 to be uh, passed between bacteria, but these are proteins being injected from bacterium to bacterium, and this, I thought, it blew my mind. So type 6 is the is the uh, highest number we have so far? Well, yeah, but the tune in, there's going to be a 7, 8, and 9, there'll be no <laughs> time. <laughs> uh, I went to the, the session on the microbes of the built environment, because that's one of my research interests, and of course, that that probably made the popular press because the most contaminated surfaces in hotel rooms um, is what everybody was was picking up on. And <laughs> what's the most contaminated surface in a hotel room? The remote control. Good. I never touch it, so that's good for me. <laughs> Not even uh, by the remote control. <laughs> But it was a fascinating talk. It was uh, chaired by Jonathan Eisen, which I found absolutely fascinating how a phylogenomicist is worried about the built environment. But it was really neat. And, and uh, Dr. Eisen has, of course, put up uh, a blog post on the topic. So rather than uh, discuss it at length, you can go and look at Jonathan's blog. Mm -hmm. But overall, it was a fascinating discussion. Um, let me ask you, let me ask you, Michael, this, I have a pet peeve when it comes to the, uh, this kind of studies done by uh, metagenomics, that is by gathering the DNA of a sample. It doesn't tell you anything about the viability of the organism, and it's usually not on any quantitative basis. So to find DNA there and to extrapolate from there that these are potential uh, dangerous bugs sitting there or whatever. That's it's it's a big, big, big stretch. Was that discussed? Uh, yes and no. I, I asked the question from the audience specifically uh, about that, and um, we specifically asked about cleaning and rebounding and other things. I've, I've published a couple of papers uh, this past year on how quickly um, bacteria rebound, and uh -huh. in fact, there was a poster um, on what bacteria are eating from the air, and it was absolutely fascinating in how they did the experiment. Mm. They did it with C14 acetate or C13 oh, okay. acetate, and they nebulized the acetate into the air, and then they tracked the acetate going into the bacteria into their uh, structure. So it was really 1950s microbiology in a modern era showing how microbes are actually pulling nutrients out of the vapor phase and actually eating them because um, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, how quickly bacteria can return in a hospital environment and people are arguing that it could come from people but I think these microbes are so embedded into the plastic surfaces in the built environment that they just literally are pulling VOCs and other nutrients out of the air oh. and they're eating them. You know, if you will, um, sort of like the, the beautiful moss that you see on oak trees in, in Charleston, you know, it, it's an epiphyte just living in the air. And, uh, wow. so that I got to find that poster card. Uh, it, <laughs> that was the one, that I found absolutely uh, a fascinating uh, poster is uh, how they were measuring. Um, I'm sorting through the cards to find the name of the, that really cool poster. But um, you know, it's it's one of those things um, that you you look and I often go to these uh, talks and I sit there and and think how some of these techniques are how uh, the way some of these people are asking questions um, can effectively uh, help me move through my stuff. And, of course, I can't find the card now. 
Uh, can I be the old curmudgeon and yes, say something please. really nasty? Yeah, sure. Um, I heard a number of papers on what is called uh, systems biology, which uh, one can argue a long time about what it means. But um, a characteristic that I found, well, irksome, is that presentations on the subject are given with a air of, I just discovered America. Oh, and yes. I know, I know what I'm talking about. I must say, I don't cotton to that because, yes, they are important, they are exciting, the techniques are amazing, everything about it is true, but, you know, we've been there before, some of us. Uh, when when the first people sequenced the first protein, boy, that was such a breakthrough. When they sequenced the first nucleic acid, that was such a breakthrough. When they did the first micro, uh, the first trans transcriptomics microarrays, that was a breakthrough. And everything was accompanied by this essentially lack of modesty. And I, I'm i old enough that I can stick my neck out and not worry about it getting chopped off because, you know, it's just a little bit of modesty, a little bit of let's wait and see, would go a long way. There, I said it, I said it. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to comment on that. I, I went to the opening session uh, the Biology of Design, The Emergence of Synthetic Biology by James Collins, where he's, this is a MacArthur winner, very famous engineer. And often the society has somebody from outside our community come and give one of the keynote talks. And this individual gave the most dynamic, uh, exciting lecture. Oh, yeah, he was out running, jumping up and down the stage. And as he was talking about some of his magic circuits, I sat there asking myself the question, I wonder if anyone has ever told him about phase variation. Because <laughs> one of the circuits he was describing was literally phase variation in salmonella to the T. And yeah. he's not a microbiologist, so I forgive him for not making the analogy to, to phase variation. But I'm wondering how many in the audience saw when he put up his third circuit design that he didn't immediately think that this was phase variation. Or if our friends Jacob and Minot were in the room, uh, which of course they couldn't be. Uh, was that dead? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't want to say that. But, you know, <laughs> as they're describing, um, as he was describing some of us other fancy circuits, uh, whether or not you begin to consider some of the LAC operon or uh, some of the other positively controlled operons that, you know, really a lot of hard work went into describing those circuits. And, you know, he, he's describing his wonderful electronic circuits because he's an electrical engineer. And I think the bacteria and a lot of the microbial geneticists before us have really described them. So I would encourage uh, Dr. Collins and his group to go back and, and look at some of Beckwith's papers and Minot's papers and um, all of those other folks because yeah. um, it will really drive home that microbiology is a systems-based science and the bacteria, through their remarkable control mechanisms, have figured it out long before man. Amen. I agree with you. I'm with you. All right, well. But that's, that's what happens when science gets into an exciting phase. I mean, people sure. get carried oh, yeah. away, sure. and that's just that's fine. I can live with it. It'll, it they'll calm down. <laughs> but I think overall, one thing I would commend is uh, the meeting planners. Our, 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 oh, yeah. our, our good friend, our former twimmer, uh, who had who was literally uh, Margaret McFall Nye, who was literally the, the planner of the meeting. She did a remarkable job putting together interesting sessions. And, Incredible. Uh, and Incredible. The meetings kept getting bigger and bigger. It was a classy bigger. meeting. And it was if a you classy meeting all around. And if you haven't come to one lately, now's the time to come back because it's like a mini sabbatical. You can refresh yourself and get re-energized very good well, hopefully good. i can go for a longer time next time next next it will be in denver 
next year. Yes. Are you going to go to that Alio? Uh, maybe. I'd like to. All right. If you go, I buy you dinner, okay? Okay. <laughs> it's a deal. All right. Uh, we have a couple of email this time, and I just want to remind everyone. You can send us your questions and comments. We love to get them to twim at twiv.tv. The first one is from Todd. He writes, just a quick note to say how much I enjoy Twim, and in particular, how much I enjoyed episode 32 featuring Rosie Redfield. I don't know how you find time to do this, but I'm glad you do. Keep up the great work. By the way... Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Thank you, Todd. I was fortunate enough to attend the SGM meeting in Dublin in March. I enjoyed hearing you talk about the use of new media as well as the rest of the meeting. I was also impressed at the weather they arranged for us. I entered Dublin into my phone's weather app several weeks before the meeting and haven't yet removed it. I haven't seen a single week with weather as nice as ours before the meeting or since. Wow. Yeah, well, SGM arranges that every year, Todd. They're powerful. <laughs> they, put, uh, they put bacteria up in the clouds or something like that. Now that makes it rain. The next one is from Spiros, who writes, My name is Spiros. I'm a manager of a biological quality lab in a pharmaceutical plant. I'm in the process of listening to all your podcasts, and I really like it. I have a microbiology degree, bachelor's from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, so I don't have the education of a lot of your friends slash guests, but what I may be able to bring to the show is a different perspective. I remember in one of the first ones, a lab tech from industry called in and asked some general questions. I don't know if this has been brought up or you were looking for someone from industry to speak on topics of pharmaceutical manufacturing and controlling flora in the environment, monitoring what we do, what we monitor, what we monitor for, and general career advice. I'll probably have to work with my company's PA division and probably legal around what I can or can't say, but I will only do that if you would be interested in having me on the show. I don't know the exact time commitment, but I will arrange to meet it if possible. I live in North Carolina, and I know one of your regular contributors is in South Carolina, so you would have the Carolinas covered. I'm only on episode six, so if you have this covered, I understand. Keep on going. Really enjoy the topics. I think the topic of control in manufacturing is very interesting, and mm -hmm. someday we should address it. It's, it's yeah. you know, pharmaceutical industry worries more about microbes because as we all know even if you inject dead e coli you still get a fever that's right but you know in addition um i'm sure that many of our readers come from some other end of microbiology i certainly know practically nothing about this i never run into it so i think it's probably a good educational idea we should deal with this topic sometime <laughs> And our final email is from Sarah, who writes, Hello, Vincent and guests. I have been an avid listener of the Twim Twiv Twip podcast for just over a year now. They help me pass the time during long animal surgery hours, even longer steerology sessions, as well as during my rollerblade home from work in Los Angeles. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, I know it's dangerous to wear headphones and rollerblade in a city where people care more about the scratches on their car than a pedestrian's broken bones if a collision occurs. But, hey, we all have to take risks for science, right? <laughs> <laughs> my question is a little delayed in terms of timing. It was sparked from the January 26th podcast looking at a possible role for microbes in the onset of autism. It was mentioned in the beginning, anatomy lesson, that the appendix may have a role in priming the gut microbiome. I know there has been at least one study that has shown a correlation between appendectomy and an increase in heart disease in humans. And I also found a paper linking germ-free mice with an increase in atherosclerotic plaque formation. I'm curious if you or your colleagues have any postulates regarding which particular groups of bacteria in the appendix may be the keystone genus within the community. Knocking them out will potentiate the results found in the germ-free mice in terms of plaque formation or other early markers of heart disease. I guess if you were going to look more closely into causal links between appendix, gut microbiota, and heart disease, where would you start 
and why? I hope that question made sense. And thanks again for the hours of entertainment. Enjoy the spring weather. Well, Sarah, we've done our job. You have figured out uh, how do you know, how do you show, and what would you do? Mm -hmm. And you've put it in context for us. And I think this is one of the great promises of the technology that is being developed for the Human Microbiome Project. And we'll probably see those papers in future TWIMS. No doubt. So basically, we don't have an answer yet, Michael, right? We don't have an answer yet, but I think she's on the right track. And I think that's why we saw so much excitement with the human microbiome stories and why they were so eager to uh, get as many of us microbiologists uh, energized about their topic area. So basically, you have to look at normal and people with heart disease at their microbiome and you make a correlation, right? Mm -hmm. But then showing causation is more difficult. And you, uh, it, you have to collect patients, um, before and after appendectomy and you have to ask questions Mm -hmm. and, you know, where do you look? And it all goes back to the simple question of how do you know? And the second question is how do you show? Hmm. Wow. And those two questions are the foundation of every good PhD thesis. So, so what you're saying is that all over the world now, people are doing these studies. And in the next decade, it's going to be an explosion of microbiome versus condition. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll be here on TWIM to tell you all about it, uh, Sarah. So stay tuned. And that is TWIM number 36. You, uh, Vincent, before you sign off, you let me just ask you, how's your microbiome today? <laughs> <laughs> it must be great because I feel wonderful. How's yours? Very regular. Very regular. I wish you a regular microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I wish yeah, you... I, 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 when I first described the microbiome to my nephews, I, I said to them, the simple question you have to ask is, rather than asking, how are you feeling, is you ask them, what is the quality of your stool? And <laughs> um, it, it really is a reflection of how well your microbiome is doing. And, you right. know, there's no, that's a really good bioassay. But remember, it's not just the microbiome. It's also your genome. And the, oh, that's true. And the that environment, right? Absolutely. And that's what I think is so fascinating about this new and emerging field. Right. All right, you can find us at microbeworld.org slash TWIM or on iTunes, and you can subscribe over there and and get the episodes automatically. And if you like TWIM and you're new to it, go over to iTunes and just rate us. It helps us to stay prominent in the iTunes directory. And as I said, send us your questions and comments to twim at twiv.tv. Alio Schechter can be found at Small Things Considered, his wonderful blog. Thank you for joining us today, Alio. My pleasure, as always. And in fact, the story that we talked about today, you you, uh, published that story on your blog. Yeah, we posted it today. It's very nice. Just today, in fact. (laughs) It's got a scary-looking cow. It does. Yeah, it does. It's a skeleton of one. (laughs) Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina, where they still use rotary phones. No, no, that's at my house. Oh, at your house. That's at my house. There's probably a rotary phone here in in the bunker that we have for the hurricanes. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Vincent. That's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at my blog, which is at virology.com. WS. Many people ask me what WS is. Does anyone, do you guys know what WS is? I don't nope. think I do. Now, are you curious? Yeah, tell us. Well, it's from Western Samoa. Every country, you know, has its own uh, domain and it's called the top level domain. And when they run out of .com, you know, they made others and WS is one of them. And it's supposed to be website, but it's Western Samoa. They're, oh. They, and my other podcast, twiv.tv, TV, is a country, oh, I'm going to forget this now, dot t, let, me, let me look it up because I don't want people to get the wrong idea. It's the extension for the country, Tuvalu. 
My God. Do you know where Tuvalu is? Yeah, it's in the Pacific. Yeah, exactly. So when that goes in the ocean, when it sinks, that'll be the end of the TV domains. That's what they say. <laughs> really? They said that? That's a joke. It's a, oh. it's a you know, it's an insider joke. Because oh, if okay. there's no country, they can't have TV. And I understand that it is sinking into the ocean. Yeah, it's one of those. That's right. That's I right. would like to thank the American Society for Microbiologies for supporting TWIM. Communications Director Barbara Hyde and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. And have a good microbiome, everyone. <laughs>